Welcome to this event as part of Manchester Science Festival, produced by the Science and Industry Museum, where we explore ideas that change the world. I'm Sally MacDonald, the Museum Director. Thank you for joining us for this event in a series hosted by Dr Helen Chersky, where we're asking, how can I be a good citizen of the world? Today, our panel of speakers are going to be discussing food in the context of climate change. We all need to eat, but almost none of us grows our own food. Instead, we rely on a huge hidden network that grows and transports our dinner from all over the world. So we'll be asking, does it make sense to transport it halfway across the planet? Do we have more or less food than we need? Do we know enough to make informed decisions about what we buy and eat? The event is about to begin. Thank you for joining us. Hello, and thank you very much to Sally for that introduction. As you heard, I'm Helen Cheresky, and I'm the host of this event, and this is the third of three. So uh, we've been looking, ask, asking the question of how to be a good citizen of the world all weekend. And this is our final topic on food. And it's all part of Manchester Science Festival's Manchester Science Festival 2021's program of online talks exploring our changing climate and ideas for the world of the future, something that we all need to think about. So before we get started, there are subtitles available for this event and you can find them if you go to the bottom right hand corner of the screen and there's a little icon there, uh, there's a gear setting and that should, um, if you click on that, you will get captions. Uh, so it is often said that you are what you eat, but now in a world of changing climate, lots of social difficulties, huge, you know, huge changes, huge problems, Food has become, we know that food is something more than just fuel, but does it say something about not just we are what we eat, but maybe we are who we are is about what we eat. And food has a cultural significance far beyond, you know, calories in, calories out, and the nutrition that we get. Um, so both us and our food are part of planet Earth. You know, we're, this is part of the nutrient cycling. Things go around and around in this planet. And um, these atoms have been here for billions of years. They are our food for a while, and then they turn into something else. And so the, the planet is constantly recycling things, and we need a food system that fits in with that. Um, you know, everything on Earth is constantly recycled. So we know that it's logically true that if we take vegetable peelings and we turn them into compost, then we can grow things in that compost. And so we sort of know theoretically about this recycling. But how does it work in practice? Does our modern food system take that into account? Does it fit within the way our planet works? Um, and we're starting to hear a lot about the importance of diets in living sustainably, not just sustainably in the sense of can we you know can we generate the resources we need to live on this planet but also in the sense of sustainably from a fairness point of view you know it, we can't have it, it, it's not, it can't be a reasonable situation that some people on the planet have too much food and some have too little um so so the impact of our food and the importance of our diet are locked into all these big social and scientific issues that we face and so that's what we're going to be talking about today. How, how can we be both a good citizen and a good citizen of planet Earth when it comes to our food? Now, our panelists have an awful lot to say about this. We're going to meet them in a second, but just a little bit of admin about how this is going to work. Um, we'll hear from each of our uh, contributors about their area of expertise and the things they really care about. And then we'll have a discussion between all of us and then the last third of this hour will be questions from the audience. So you can contribute your questions actually all the way through. We're going to be using Slido for this. So the way you can join in with the questions and it, it, you, can, you can do it now, but we'll only get to the questions towards the end. The way to join in is to go to slido.com and to enter the code FCW, and that will take you to a Slido page. And what you'll be able to do there is add in your own questions, see questions that other people have asked, and then you can vote other people's questions up and down so that uh, we can see which are your most popular questions and we can prioritize them on that basis. So do be thinking, as our panelists are talking, be thinking about questions for them, be putting them into Slido, keep an eye on that at the same time. 
But it is time to meet our panelists and we have a superstar bunch here. We've got uh, Karen Bell, who is the founder and director of Open Kitchen Manchester, which is Manchester's leading conscious caterer. We'll be finding out what that is. And their mission is to stop perfectly edible food from being wasted and to work with local and sustainable food producers to produce um, organic and ethical and seasonal food. Next up, we have Professor Sarah Bridal, who recently wrote a book called Food and Climate Change Without the Hot Air. And she's actually a professor at the School of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Manchester. But it turns out that cosmology skills can be used in the topic of food as well. And so um, she has uh, been looking at agriculture and food research. And then last but not least, we have Aisha Arif, who is the Community Development Director for the Berry Active Women's Centre in Greater Manchester. And they have a fantastic project. They set up a halal food bank um, because other food banks in Bury were not producing uh, food that, that met the requirements of the community. And so she, she works in that area. Okay, so we're going to learn a little bit more about each of our contributors and we're going to start with Corinne. Now, the way we're going to do this is each of them has an object to introduce themselves. So Corinne, what's your object and what does it say about you? Um, so I had a little think about what to bring and decided to go with, um, this is a just as an example. So it's a jar of oil um, and it's an example of one of the reasons that food goes to waste. So in our modern global food system, we have trading standards and trades descriptions. And what you tend to find with low value products that are made on a massive scale in huge quantities is that when you hit any sort of issue with production, um, in this case, uh, machinery just sort of mucking up and underfilling slightly, it's cheaper to dump the entire stock than it is to pay the staff to de-bottle and then re-bottle, de-label, relabel. Um, so it's just, it, it was an example of why food goes to waste at a really industrial scale and quite far back up the food chain. So long before it hits a supermarket, long before retail um, consumers ever get the chance to see it, long before it's in a retail environment, this is an example of why food goes to waste. And I guess the important thing that this demonstrates for me is that food is a business. Food doesn't go to waste when it's bad or it's moldy or it's going to make someone sick. Food goes to waste when it's cheaper to dump it from the system than it is to keep it in. And that's something that keeps me up at night. So tell us a little bit about this, this description of a, being a conscious caterer. How does that work? Um, it's with what we're trying to do with the work that we do is tackle both sides of the sustainability coin so we have one side of sustainability where there are big problems today like food waste and in the short term the lowest carbon most sustainable thing we can do with perfectly edible food that will go to waste is get it in a belly any belly rather than a bin and that's about carbon mass and carbon footprint but we also wanted to start pushing on the longer term issues. So in the long term, I hope that there won't be any food waste or that there will be significantly less food waste. So we also work with directly with local, organic, seasonal, sustainable producers. Um, and we sort of mix food that would otherwise go to waste, ingredients that would otherwise go to waste with ingredients that are purchased directly from farms, directly from producers. Um, and with that, we make beautiful ethical catering. And it was sort of a way of, of demonstrating the problems that we currently have, but also saying these, you know, redistributing the outputs of a hugely wasteful system that our planet can't sustain is not a solution. It's a sticking plaster. And we want to be really, really clear about that. So we also felt the need to demonstrate the future. And just very quickly on on the identifying waste. Say you find a company that's just thrown a, a, is about to perhaps throw away a load of oil because of this problem. Can you just say to them, just give it to us, uh, or or is it is that is is that in itself difficult to do? Um, it's it's more about a sort of longer term process of building a relationship with different producers and manufacturers. You know, obviously they still have food safety and health and safety regulations to meet. So 
it takes a little while to build up a relationship. We sign some uh, service level contracts. Sometimes we're asked to sign non-disclosure agreements with companies because food waste is a hot topic and it's a bit embarrassing. Um, but yeah, then we basically, we act as a service for those businesses because us going collecting that food actually saves them money because otherwise they would have to pay for that food to be dealt with in some way through a waste stream. Brilliant, thank you. Well, let's move on to uh, Sarah. Sarah, what's what's your object and what does it say about you? Well, I've brought along uh, the climate food flashcards that we made and uh, basically these cards have got um, information about the amount of greenhouse gas emissions from each food. And I guess partly because I find them really interesting, but also partly because it reminds me of being at uh, science festivals in, 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 you know, in real life and having a great time talking to people. So I'm really excited to be here today. So give us an example of what's on one of those cards. What pick pick one out and tell us what it says. Okay. Well, I've got two here. If I come just uh, do lamb, which is one of my favourite things, and lentils. And you can see here that. A portion of lamb causes about the same climate change as driving a car for 30 minutes, whereas the lentils portion is about the same as driving a car for one minute. So I think that really illustrates the fact that there's big differences between different types of food. And just talk to us a little bit about your background, because obviously you're sitting there with these fabulous uh, images of the earth, which I very much approve of, obviously, and the stars behind you. Uh, and you're here talking to us about food. How, how do you get how do you get from cosmology to the uh, carbon footprint of lamb? Um, well, I suppose I spent the last 20 years doing astrophysics research. And then about five years ago, my kids started at school and I finished a big project and started thinking about the next 20 years and imagining my kids saying to me, what did you do about climate change, mummy? And me saying, I looked at the stars and just thinking, I can't actually sleep at night with that. So yeah, that was a bit of an epiphany. And how's it been moving into that world? Has it, has it, because often I feel the thing, especially in, um, you know, so I'm, you know, I'm a physicist as well. And the nice thing about physics sometimes is that it's very well behaved compared with other things. You do an experiment, you know, if, you, if it goes wrong, you do it again. And, you know, there's this kind of, you can kind of control what's going on. Whereas when you come into issues like the food system, you're suddenly dealing with, enormous complications you can't do any experiments to prove something does or doesn't work because it's always a confounding factor although you can find things out right was it how does it feel moving from a nice tidy area of physics into this gigantic human mess yeah i absolutely agree with you on that i mean i, I suppose i initially thought what i'll do is i'll use my data analysis skills from analyzing images of sky and I actually at one point used the same bit of code to look at a galaxy as I was using to look at a field of wheat um, and thinking about improving crop yield by you know using technology and that was how I started but then when I learned about the relative climate impacts of different food then I realized actually dietary change was even more important and much more even more potential to make a big difference so started moving more into that area and I guess data analysis it's talking to people um, it's uh, it's you know working together across big teams but at the end of the day when you put a result out in astrophysics it's not really going to affect people's livelihoods whereas that's what really gets me about the food is the fact that you know these are there are food producers behind all of these numbers and they're going to be affected by what happens Brilliant. Thank you very much. Well, let's come to Aisha. So Aisha, um, tell us, show us your object and, and what it says. Tell us what it says about you. Oh, can, can we hear Aisha? Yep. Hi there. Sorry. I am bringing this object actually represent uh, here is a police commendation award that I have received from Sir Ian Hopkins. Uh, this is supporting the women of Bury by providing advice and guidance for domestic violence and hate crime, and also supporting the vulnerable victims of Bury. Reason I bought this um, object is Bury is famous for uh, the birthplace of Sir, Sir Robert Peel. Sir Robert Peel was twice the Prime Minister of UK and also he's been um, Home Secretary twice. Um, he was, um, he set up the organised police policies and he, he, hence he is the founder of the modern police. He had three core values, 
and three ideas. Um, uh, first of uh, them is preventing crime not by catching criminals. Our principle is to prevent um, hardships to the local community. Um, the second um, idea was the preventing crime uh, by going gaining public support. Our principle is to achieve results and gaining local support. His third core, core idea was to receive uh, public support by respecting community principles. We work with all community, understanding that all have the same core value, hence we bring uh, the communities together. So that's the reason I bought that object today. Thank that you. Is, it's a very powerful reminder and a, a reminder of how far back these principles go, that these are very powerful. They're, they're not new ideas. They're just ideas that we, we always continue to have to work to. Now, tell us a little bit about your Halal Food Bank. And, you know, you're, you're talking about the principles here of listening, you know, respecting community need. And, and this being a way of, of, of building community, you know, cohesion. Tell us about your food bank and why it was necessary. Um, I work with the diverse community of Berry, which is um, uh, the um, Middle Eastern community, the South Asian community, the African community, the European communities. And um, since COVID-19, the pandemic happened and um, uh, working with these communities, I've come across with people struggling uh, with having the right food according to their dietary needs. And their need wasn't accommodating at the time when people lost their jobs and they have lost the income due to the, the uh, pandemic that uh, hit everybody across the whole world in March, especially in uh, UK in March 2020. Um, I had keep people coming in saying that we don't have enough food because we've not got enough income and the food that we are receiving from other food banks um, is not edible for us only because um, it's not according to our dietary requirements. Secondly, the people we serve, uh, English is not their first language. So the ingredients that are on there, they can't read. So hence, they can't really know how to utilize an item that was given to them. So by doing consultation with these beneficiaries or these people who are actually struggling, we've come across that Berry hasn't got a halal food bank, which accommodates a need of the community that Berry has. Berry has, like I said, very rich community of diverse people living in there. So we actually established this initially, got a small funding from the local council um, to set up uh, the local halal food bank. Hence, we've given the name Fusion Food Bank of Berry because Berry has this fusion community and we are serving everybody according to their dietary requirement. Brilliant. Thank you. And just finally, um, when, when we spoke before this uh, event, you told me you were talking to me about what food means to you uh, and that it's not just fuel. Tell us a little bit about what food means to you. To me, food uh, is bringing communities bringing together. For me, if I, put food, if I set a table of food out there and it, I invite everybody, I'll know I'll be bringing people together because food for me is bringing people and communities together. You can't comprehend, you can't you know, change that because everybody loves food and that is so, so important. You can have laughters, you can have joke on a sitting on a table together, you can have beautiful conversation, you can talk to each other, you can learn more about where it's come from, what it's made of. So you actually go into the cultures or the the item itself in a dish, and then you can have a, a lot of conversation going on, bringing laughters, jokes, basically, hence bringing everybody together. Well, that is a fabulous starting point for our discussion. So, so we've got these two ends of the of the system, of the system, if you like, which is that there's this massive 
you know, there are big farms and supply chains and economics and all these things that generate our food and, and bring it into supermarkets and, and shops. And then you have the other end, which is people sitting at a table together, building a community around the food they're eating. So let's start with the first bit of that. Sarah, can you could you give us a bit of an overview, the, the, the sort of big picture stuff of where our food comes from and what's what's wrong with the food system we've got now? What could be improved about it? OK, well, at the moment, about a quarter of all greenhouse gas emissions, so about a quarter of all climate change that's happening is coming because of food. And that includes clearing land for agriculture, it includes fertilizers on the fields, rearing livestock, um, processing and transporting and, and getting that to the consumer and, and includes cooking. And that is increasing as there's more people uh, demanding more greenhouse gas emissions intensive foods. But also if we hopefully uh, massively reduce our fossil fuel usage, then food will be the big thing where it's at in terms of climate change. And so how, how much, who controls this? I mean, that's perhaps a political question, but you know, who makes decisions about how this food system works? Well, we have this discussion in, in some of the food research meetings, and I have to admit, I'm often, uh, often um, not agreeing with the other people on my table. So I, I put that out there first, but I guess we're often asked, you know, who has the power here? Is it the consumer, the supermarket, or the politicians? Um, and I guess food producers should be on that list as well. Now, I personally believe that consumers have the greatest power in this. If you look at what happened with plastics, for example, you can see the supermarkets and the politicians running over, running, tripping over themselves to try and get what the consumers want, which is to remove the plastics from the supply chain and from, the, from what people get on their plates and, and, and buy from the supermarkets. So I think consumers have a huge amount of power. I don't want to push that sort of um, responsibility onto the consumer, but at the same time, I hope it's, you know, consumers, if they demand more changes from governments and supermarkets, then they will have to happen. Well, let's move on to the concept of a, a food food citizenship. So Corinne, this is something I think you can speak to. What Tell us what what's a, what's a good food citizen? What does a good food citizen do? What's this all about? Um, so food citizenship, the main body of work around this has been produced by the Food Ethics Council. Um, they have a, a, a brilliant report that came out probably just over a year ago uh, around food citizenship. And it's the idea that at the moment, um, the, the general public have quite a limited relationship to food, uh, mainly as a consumer. It's about what you what you buy. Um, and the idea essentially is, you know, that as the saying goes, I, I'd love to think it was some old wise phrase. I, I think it actually came from the Spider-Man movie um, with great power comes great responsibility. Spider-Man's Uncle Ben, I think. Um, but it works the other way as well. You know, with with a sense of absolutely no power comes a feeling of absolutely no responsibility. And that particularly applies the less money you have. You know, if you find yourself in food poverty or on the verge of food poverty, and you feel like your options are, well, I can either go to this really cheap supermarket or I can go to this pound shop or, I'm, you know, my, my options are so limited that I can go to a food bank or a food pantry scheme and that's it. Why, if you feel like you have so little power and choice, would you ever feel like you have any responsibility for our food system? And I love what Sarah said about consumers having a huge amount of power they absolutely do i think the issue is sometimes they don't know it and that can be a problem so the idea of food citizenship is that what we need to do is push through this idea of having a very limited relationship to food as a consumer and become a food citizen and a food citizen is someone who is actively co-creating their food system so a food citizen doesn't just consume doesn't just buy they grow they attend they participate they organize and when you're in a difficult position and you're maybe in crisis, that can be as simple as attending a local free community meal. And then it could be about volunteering on a community allotment for an hour a week to get some veg. And then as you've got more time, more energy, more resources, it could be about getting really involved in growing together, cooking together, eating together. And exactly what Aisha was talking about, you know, we need a real sense of community Food can't just be about money. 
because it is, it's how we gather, it's how we celebrate, it's how we find a lot of meaning. And we need to bring that back into our food system. So um, how does this, I can see that there's a lot of things, we're talking quite theoretically here, that there are, um, you know, that these big system things, it's like, how do we connect that with individual citizens? Like what, what you know, how much can, a, can an individual do? Um, Aisha, talk to us a little bit about how community, how sharing food helps create community and how, what, what have you seen, you know, as you, as you bring communities together, together around food, does it change their attitude to each other? Do they talk about the food? Because I guess a lot of the communities, you know, you've said this might be unfamiliar food to some of them. Do they, do they think about where food comes from or, you know, perhaps some of them have come from other countries where they were farmers or they had experience of where their food comes from. How do they see how, you know, how do they talk about food when, when they come together in these communities? So first of all, the hardship that they are going through or uh, their most important um, thinking is, do we have food tomorrow or do we have food for our, our uh, families for the, for, to, to enjoy? They do, with the tin, tin food, if I, de if I deliver a tin food to them, they think it's not good enough for them. They need to have the fresh products. Th that is not in their diet. They've never used that because the countries they've come from, they never had the idea of tin food. So initially when I started giving them the packed food or the tin food, they were returning this to me saying that we've never used this before. We don't know how to use this or what is it? Uh, we always like fresh food. So they were re returning tin foods to me, thinking that this is something which is not suitable for their health. So what I've done is when I'm creating a package, I am actually not putting too much of tin food. The only few things that I'm giving, like item-wise, for example, maybe tin tomatoes or just some tin fruit, and that's it. That's to maximise, because I have had the experience that they've returned that. But that is because, what I think is because they've never had the option of having tin foods. They've always had the fresh food. Uh, they didn't have to think about or either. They don't know how to use it. Like I mentioned before, because English is not their first language. So sometimes if they want to be, um, do you know, um, they want to challenge themselves or want to use an item, then they ask me, how do I use this item and what it is for? Can I use it in this or can I? So they're exploring ideas because they've never, they've got an item they've never used. So we are always discussing about different um, food that we create out of a, a pack or out of a tin or out of a box. It's really interesting. I think that um, you you mentioned the idea of fresh food being fresh food being food, and you know we know that the ability to store food in in things like tins it means you can keep it over the winter. It means you can store up supplies. You know it's got advantages. But it's interesting listening to you say that how much you know. I think in the Western world we we have been very dependent on certainly prepared food. You know there are pro, very very over processed packaged foods are now, you know, they, they were very popular. And now people are saying, well, maybe that's not such a good idea. And, and the communities you're talking about never went through that stage. They just know that fresh food is best. And there's all this messaging in our society that fresh food is best. And um, they already knew that. So that's an interesting um, point. Sarah and Corin, perhaps, how does transparency work in all of this? Because one of the things I can see a lot of consumers, you know, we're talking about the, the people Aisha's talking about, they don't know even, you know, they can't necessarily read what's in the tin, but, but the rest of us really aren't much better. You know, we can read what's in the tin, but we still don't really know what it is or where it came from quite a lot of the time, I think, with, with packaged products. How much, how easy is it to find out what's actually going on inside the food system and where it all comes from? Sarah, it sounds like you might have some insight into this. Well, I mean, when I started trying to find out about greenhouse gas emissions from food, then I wanted to know, you know, what was the climate impact of what I ate yesterday? You know, I'll just go, I'll just Google it. And then I realized, oh, 
that's really, really hard to get this information. And then I spent like three years reading research papers and, uh, to find out the answers. So um, I think it's really, really hard to find this information out. And I really want that transparency to happen. I want to see these numbers, you know, on the packets, on the front of the food packets, so that we don't all have to sort of look into the academic literature to find out. Um, so then people can make these conscious decisions and also give their input into how the food system itself should be changed. And how does this this interact with, you know, wanting to share food more? So one of the questions, you know, we're hearing sort of implicit in this discussion here is there are those of us who are lucky enough to be able to choose, you know, have completely free choice about whether we buy, I don't know, the very expensive, super special Italian pasta or the, you know, Sainsbury's type. And there are people who don't have the luxury of that choice. How do we... Um, you know the transparency in the system how much is this tied up with fairness that that basically there are people who who don't have any real choice in the food system and it's not fair that they can't get enough food that they can't you know how do we balance these two things as this drive towards um doing things better having transparency and the fact that, you know there are people as aisha talks about who who don't who are struggling to have enough to eat issue and i think some of this you know the there are organizations, uh, not just in this country, but all over the world, some of them with the best of intentions and some of them with a bit of an agenda, but kind of present the idea that there is food waste, there are people who are in poverty, so we apply one problem to the other, and that's a solution. And actually it's, it's not, you know, in the short term, we've got a problem and in the very short term, you know, people need to eat today. And we need to do something about that. But in the longer term, actually, some of this issue is not about food at all. It's about supporting people in getting out of poverty in real and long lasting ways. And that's about economics. It's about pushing people towards things like the real living wage employer scheme. You know, the, the food system is part of the problem, but it's it's part of a much bigger issue. And I think whenever we start talking about food poverty and crisis, we've always kind of got to look forward and say, actually, when we talk about someone who's in food poverty, we're just talking about someone who's in poverty. We talk about food poverty because we have food banks. Well, the three big spends in anybody's life are food, housing and energy utility bills. So we could just have easily at a certain point in our history gone down, you know, we have housing benefit, we could have gone down a, a route that was more geared towards that, we could have gone down a route that was more geared towards an energy bank or, and weirdly, we've gone down the food route, we give people food who are in crisis in other countries, they get given money that they can choose to spend on food or bills. And we don't do that. And there's a whole discussion there that probably isn't for today about why we don't do that. And about whether you know, how we feel about people who are in poverty and that maybe we do still blame those people for their own situation and maybe we don't trust those people to make good decisions with money. Um, sorry, slightly off topic there, but it's a, you know, it's way bigger than food. It's about society in general. Well, as we're getting into these sticky topics, I'd just like to remind the audience that Slido is there waiting for your questions. We'll get to that in a few minutes. But if you'd like to join in, go to slido.com and enter the code FCW. So now I want to I want to pick up on this. I want to on the issue we've we, we've heard that there are climate impacts of food and we have heard that there are people who, you know, struggle to get enough food. And I just want to talk about price in all of this, because I think as we've heard, you know, and as Corinne said, these become sort of economic decisions, right? It's it's about reasons getting made because of money. So let's talk about the price of food because we can see theoretical ways to make food more climate friendly, but it's got to work on the ground. Aisha, talk to us about the importance of price, the price to uh, your food bank and, and the people you're serving. It's very important for us because obviously we need to make sure that the price is right, that we buy from the... We try not to go um, to the supermarkets because the prices are really high. We have been working with Fair Share where we can go and pick up a, a 
18 box of cereal for £3.47 pence, which is 18 boxes. But if you go to supermarket, just one of those boxes of 750 grams is £3.47 each. So the price difference makes a huge difference in people's life as well. And, and it's so expensive going to supermarkets. For example, I've been to Iceland um, last weekend to collect some milk. The reason was that there wasn't enough milk at Fair Share for me to go and buy. So I ended up going to Iceland um, uh, uh, wholesalers and I picked up about 48 one litre cartons of milk and it costed me um, around 42 pounds. And that was a big price for me to pay just to um, pick up 48 cartons of one litre milk on that day and it was shocking obviously because if i could pick up 18 box of 750 gram cereal for three pound 47 and i'm paying 48 uh, cartons of milk for 42 pounds it's it's a shock for me obviously it's affecting the budget i have that means i have to cut on certain items to provide to the people i'm supporting hence they are missing out on certain items because the other food item has cost so much but i it is very very difficult because the prices are soaring up but i can see that happening everywhere because it's 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 not making it easier for people to have a healthy meal on a limited budget and we're all working and living on a limited budget at the moment and it is so, so difficult to people to have a healthy meal, to be honest with you. Thank you. And um, well, let's carry on with it. So let's go back then to Sarah and this issue of price. So, you know, and I think this, I mean, these, these are disparate perspectives and I think it's very important. And then we'll come to Corinne on, on the waste thing. But so Sarah, where, if we want to eat food, you know, the, the foods on your cards that are more climate friendly, are they the more expensive ones? is having food that is produced in a more sustainable way, is it more expensive or is it less expensive? Yeah, great question. I mean, yes, yeah, so there are lots of foods that are very climate friendly, which are, which, which are relatively cheap and um, pulses and, and fresh fruit and vegetables. You know, they, they're not always the most expensive things um, in, in the basket. Um, at the same time, the climate impact of all of the food that we eat is, is not reflected in the price that we're paying for it you know we're doing this damage to the environment and yet we're not actually paying for that damage to be fixed through the the way that we pay for our food at the moment i mean it's quite controversial the idea that we might actually add some sort of climate tax to food but one way or another i think that we need to adjust the you know the prices of the food to somehow make it at least more attractive to buy some of the lower impact foods otherwise i don't see how people are realistically going to be able to change and that's certainly the thing, I mean, the question of pulses. So I, I'm a lifelong vegetarian, I'm mostly vegan now. And so I'm always the one at the pub, you know, remember those when uh, you, you are, you'd, if you look at the options, there's, there's these things that are um, a steak and chips or whatever it is, meat eaters eat, I genuinely don't know. And there's a kind of price for all the meat dishes. And then there's a vegetarian chili, which is half the price. And uh, even in the pub, it's half the price. And so I've also, I've always you know, and I don't, I don't mind, but effectively I've been having half price meals at pubs just because I don't eat meat for years because it's cheaper food and, and meat, you know, we know that meat and dairy have a large impact on the climate. They're also expensive. Um, mm. And it's interesting that these two things cross over. So um, Corin, talk to us a little bit about, so, you know, Sarah's talking about the impact of producing food and the cost associated with that, but you're talking about you know the dam you know the damage being done the cost the money being spent and then this stuff being thrown away so why is it why is it so hard to get rid of food first of all give us the stats because i know they're horrific and the amount of food waste but why is it so hard to get rid of food waste like why are we not just using this waste because you know there are communities that need it we've put the resources into generating it why is it so hard to make use of it uh, so the stats, um, it's always difficult to get a handle on, um, but it's a, a roundabout in the UK, about 10 million tonnes of food that goes to waste every year. Globally, it's estimated to be around 1.3 billion tonnes. So the tricky thing is 
what that looks like is we produce enough food to feed everyone on this planet and then we throw a third of it away normally for cosmetic and financial logistical reasons um so as i said earlier that's, food that's, is the, that, that's the statistic i find horrifying that we throw a third of all and i understand there's going to be a bit of weight you can you put you pack there's always going to be a little bit that kind of leaks out to the side or something but a third is this yeah. horrific amount yeah sorry carry on and it's food is a business that's the that's the reality so just to bring you know aisha has a perspective that is very much on the ground it's what she sees every day and it's about food poverty and it's about supporting people and sarah has a perspective that is more global and is about systems and is about climate change and just to try and bring those two together in some way um so the the honest truth is food needs to get more expensive this battle that the supermarkets have been having for years you know if you ask consumers at the moment what their main concern is about food they'll probably talk to you about price and you'll see you know aldi have an advert out at the moment that specifically says you can get the same stuff from us that you can get from tesco's and we are cheaper that's what they're hammering we're cheaper we're cheaper we're cheaper and this battle that the supermarkets are having to drive down the prices of food is not helping any of us so at the moment the average age of a farmer in the uk is in the late 60s it's around 68 69 and no one knew was getting in the game because at the moment you can't really make a living as a farmer in the uk and that's directly related to supermarkets driving down prices so this is the point at which food and pricing actually becomes about economics and becomes a wider issue we don't need food to get cheaper we need to support people in the uk and all over the world in getting out of poverty in real and long-lasting ways because if we just focus on food as one tiny aspect of the system and we continue to just try and drive the price of food down it becomes less sustainable because you end up doing things like supermarkets say we can't afford to pay uk farmers so we will go to kenyan farmers who have fewer rights, have fewer protections under the law, we're a massive multinational supermarket, and it encourages practices like clearing wild forested land to grow cash crops of things like soy, runner beans, all sorts. And it, it makes our food system more and more and more and more unsustainable. So we have this we have this difficulty that we have you know the food we produce has an impact on our environment the one of the ways to fix that is to value the food and value the farmers who produce it but that means it costs more and if we're going to deal with that then we need to provide the communities aisha is talking about with support so that they can afford to buy food which is good for them and good for the climate and you know you can see these are all big changes but these are all important facets okay let's move to some questions from the audience so as a reminder to the audience uh, on slido if you put in the code fcw uh, you will be able to see all the questions that are there at the moment and uh you can add more and vote up the ones that are already there so let's start with the first question uh, and uh it's from alex and alex would like to know what is the single most effective thing we can do at home to reduce food waste who would like to pick up on that Ooh, on, um, it's probably my bag um well there's a few things um i guess starting to grow something anything um you know something that you'll use even if you live in a flat if you could grow some herbs on a windowsill that will stop you buying fresh herbs if you could grow some tomatoes in the garden that will stop you buying tomatoes that's something um and then just uh, start reading the labels work out where it's come from um, and buy as locally as you can. Local and seasonal is a big thing um, because you tend to find that if you buy local and seasonal, it'll be fresher, it'll be more nutritious, it'll last a little longer. And also if you start reading the labels and you know where it's come from, you develop a, more of a connection to your food. Brilliant. Any other tips on food waste from uh, Sarah or Aisha? Well, Go if, on, I, Sarah. if I could add in, um, so, it, yeah, I totally agree with everything Corinne said about becoming more connected with food and, and, and certainly trying to reduce the food that's wasted further up the supply chain. But also, 
you know, about 70% of food waste in the UK happens in the home. And so it's a lot we can do at home and the tips that work are in terms of planning, you know, making sure we're using up the leftovers the next day and freezing things. If we, if we only open a packet and don't want half of it, then remembering to freeze the other half right away and then use that a different day is also shown to help. Brilliant. Um, okay, so let's this, we've got a quick question now for Sarah from Ben, which is where can we get a copy of your food cards? The ones you oh, um, yeah, do download them from our website, totally free. Um, you can even, copyrights even, that you can download them, print them, sell them. You know, we just want people to, to spread this information. All the original literature that's uh, referenced is, is on the website as well. So take a bite oh. out of climate change, food flashcards. That's the website. That's the website. Is it, what's the website yeah. name? Take, take a bite out of climate change. Take a bite uh, cc.org. Okay. Right, so that is where you can find the food cards and print them out and share them. Um, so do we think it should be, or is, let's go to, so there's an anonymous question here is, teaching children about food in schools, do you think there should be more of it? What, what should we be teaching children about food in schools? And I'm sure all of you can contribute to this. So uh, who would like to go first on teaching children about food? And, and should that education happen in schools or should it happen in other places? Uh, are you um, sure you, you look like you can say, you know? <laughs> I would say education does start from home as well as school. Um, like, for example, if I'm giving my son carrots or apples or something like that, I'm telling him the nutritional values of this and I'm telling them how important it is for him to, uh, for example, the apples, how the values, the the it's good for your health, it's good for your brain. So I'm teaching them at home as well. But in school, this is very important because obviously they spend a lot of time together and they're exploring ideas. They're creating and exploring and talking to their peer, uh, peers, their friends, and they're talking to the teachers. So it opens up more ideas because they children are like sponges. They will take all the information in, which will be utilized afterwards as well. So I'd say home and school will be best place for children to learn about food, about the nutritional values, about the wastage, the recycling, uh, about the food, and and I'd say it's 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 good to start home as well as school for this. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, uh, Corin. Um, yeah, I think teaching children to cook from scratch. You know, Aisha was saying she's dealing with communities who don't want tin food, don't want processed food. I think some of the communities that I've worked with are are the opposite of that and don't know what to do with anything that isn't a microwave meal. You know, I've certainly worked with communities that if you gave them a bag of lentils and, and you know, some other basics would just look at it and go, that's not a meal. So I think little, you know, practical tips like how to cook from scratch, bulk cooking and freezing, as Sarah was saying, you know, they are more traditional skills that are getting a little bit lost now because in the very short term if you're strapped for cash it can feel like a cheaper option to go and buy a really cheap ready meal or to go and buy a you know a bag of chips than to go and spend three or four pounds on some basic ingredients and make meals for a week so i think those skills but it's not just kids i mean i know people in their 20s 30s who have, you know, we've had a real fast food three or four decades um, just growing and growing. So it's, um, yeah, schools, home, workplaces, um, just in our communities generally, I think some solid investment from the government, maybe someone um, into lots of free community cooking classes would be a brilliant step forward. I do remember, you know, one of the those little horrifying things that stays with you. I was talking to a group of school kids who must have been about 11 or 12 about uh, bubble physics, actually. And I was talking about gas expanding like bread rising. And the thing that confused the most was the idea of bread rising in the oven. There were genuinely kids in that class who had never seen bread rising in the oven. Um, Corinne, just on this question of education, could you say something very quickly about food hubs? Because I think they are an important contributor to this. Tell, tell us a little bit about what those might be. 
Um, so the idea of a food hub is very flexible, but one of the things um, that is a, a big idea that's coming out going forward, so there's a lot of talk at the moment about the 15 minute town, the 20 minute town, that's basically getting back to being really local, you know, just the, the area that's around you that is, you know, maybe about a mile that you could walk uh, around to in 15, 20 minutes. And the idea of a food hub is that going forward, what would be really positive to our communities would be to have food hubs that might be predominantly about growing. So it could be a shared community allotment. They might also have buildings on them. So it might be about cooking together. It might be about learning to cook together. It might be about sitting and eating together. It might be about sharing recipes, but it's those ideas that Aisha was talking about around food not just being about buying and what you can afford and not just being about what's in your house but being a real part of the community um and my my big hope is that going forward we will in greater manchester and beyond we will invest in the idea of of local food hubs well i would love to see a local as soon as one uh, turns up i would love to hear about it because it sounds like a great um, initiative for lots of reasons and as you said it's interesting so we've had this series of three talks uh, you know this is the last, last of three about issues surrounding climate and all of them come back to super local things like there's this really strong message coming through repeatedly that it's the small local things that are based on community like there's all these big societal things you know that are needed but fundamentally building stronger local communities and doing things together actually solves so many of these problems all in one go and you know the food hub could also be the local transport hub where the bikes are and also the place where different communities come together and you respect each other's views and there's more tolerance and you know it's 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 all linked up um sarah did you have anything to add on education before we move on oh well just very briefly to say you know i think we need to have a really fresh look at how climate change is addressed in schools and you know kids are saying that there's not enough about it in there and food is going to be a big part of that as well and getting this into schools is is crucial and, and it's not easy to map it onto the curriculum at the moment i think yes i think well i feel schools my only difficulty with the schools thing is that they it seems to be their job to do everything and I sort of there's a there's a there's a there's a danger that you put oh it's the school's responsibility and like Aisha said a lot of it starts in the home or in other places um so let's take a question quite a specific one from Pip um which is a conundrum about is it better to buy and this is the sort of thing that if you think about your if you try and choose food if you're in a supermarket and you try to choose a low impact food this is the sort of thing you face um should we is it better to buy apples that are grown locally but are packaged in a plastic unrecyclable bag or buy fruit which is you know she it doesn't come with packaging but it's been shipped from spain who has anyone got any ideas on that <laughs> Go on, Sarah. i guess i can the climate the climate change perspective on that um so in terms of um, plastic packaging, it, it's not a big deal for the uh, climate, but it has got other issues, you know, beyond the climate. Um, but at the same time, uh, things that can be transported by ship, um, it generally the shipping uh, effect on climate is, is very small. It's about 100 times worse for the environment if those things are brought by air. But if they're brought by ships, then usually those emissions are, are relatively small um, and, and are comparable to the emissions from producing that product in the first place. Even if it comes from New Zealand, the shipping emissions are still lower from producing an apple than actually producing the apple itself in the first place. So shipping has got has become a bit of a you know a bigger deal than it really should be in terms of climate change. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I can see, I can imagine. Um, so Spain is where the sunshine is. So I imagine if you want to grow something that needs a lot of sunshine, it's better to grow it in Spain than in Britain, where you need lights and heaters and extra fertilizer. But New Zealand's got the same climate we've got. So I'm slightly more suspicious personally of the idea that we need to bring food from New Zealand because they grow the same stuff we grow. But in Spain, you can grow stuff that we can't grow. And I'm sure it's a very complicated issue, um, but it is difficult. So, OK, let's. Um, pick up on a question here it's come up in a few different guises but um the plant-based diet so you know i've i've already held my hand up on this i am almost i almost entirely eat a plant-based diet and i have um almost all my life so what so i'm 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 biased on this but what's the opinion on plant-based diets and you know how much should we expect to eat meat and how much should we 
you know, what's how serious is it? Because I hear a lot of people asking this question because they don't want the answer to be eat less meat. So, <laughs> Sarah, and then Corinne. Uh, um, yeah, so from a climate perspective, then, I mean, on average, vegan diets cause about half the climate change of a, a standard omnivore kind of uh, average diet. So so there are differences. And certainly, you know, on average, uh, plant based foods tend to cause less emissions than, than animal based foods. But at the same time, there are differences. You know, if you're going to air freight things, then that's that then puts it in a similar category to, to animal products. Um, and there's other things in terms of oven use, for example, which again can you know, push things up, even if they're vegan, and they can still cause you know more climate change if you're going to put them in an oven for two hours. So um, it is more complicated than just going plant based. And the big thing that I would say is if we take that example of lamb, if you just have half the amount of lamb, then you've already halved your climate impact pretty much because your meal was already dominated by the amount of lamb you had. So I would definitely say look at quantities first, rather than cutting entire things out of your diet. Um, uh, Corinne, have you got anything to add on um, plant based diet, especially from the point of view of waste? I mean, is there waste in the meat and dairy producing areas in the same way there is for plant waste? Yeah, huge amounts, absolutely huge amounts. Um, and some of that is due to the fact that meat obviously is a higher risk product. It has a use by date, not a best before date. And so in terms of so best before dates are on low risk products like fresh veg, and it is legal to sell a product past its use by date and consumers normally feel more comfortable making choices about, well, that head of broccoli is a day past its best before date, but I can look at it, I can smell it, I can feel confident. High risk products like meat and dairy have use by dates. It is illegal to sell a product past its use by date because it's a food safety issue. And again, consumers sometimes will, you know, life gets a bit chaotic, you buy, lamb, beef, whatever, intending to cook with it, put it in the fridge and then look at it and it's past its date. And a lot of people these days don't have the connection with food. They don't feel comfortable, you know, opening the packet, looking at it, smelling it and trying to work out if that's still okay to eat. So a lot of high risk foods that have a really high carbon footprint, like meat and dairy will go to waste simply because we've lost touch with our food and consumers don't know when it's okay to eat and when it isn't. So the date then becomes a, you know, so a, a line that never gets crossed. Well, there's a lot more to discuss here, but we are pretty much at the end of the time we've got. I do have one final question for each of you. If you could give a relatively short answer, that would be a good thing because we're close to the end. And you know, one of the difficulties with change, I think, is imagining what the future is like. It's much easier to say, well, we want more of that if we can imagine what it looks like. So what I'm, I would like each of you to do is imagine ourselves in Manchester in 2030 and paint that picture for us. Give us an example of something which you really want to exist, a way of doing things, a system, labeling, availability, what will be different in 2030? So we know what the future might look like. Um, Sarah, you can go first. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I'd love to see, um, you know, I'd love to see labeling on all food packets that shows the climate impacts. And I'd also love the food environment to have changed in a way that was sort of, you know, consultative uh, and bringing everybody on board that actually makes it easier for us to make climate friendly choices all the time, uh, rather than it being something that you have to really consciously think about. Brilliant. Um, Corinne, what would you like to see in 2030 in Manchester? Um, I, I, for me, it all comes back to the food hubs. What I would like to see by 2030 is that we've started, at least started, to deconstruct this massive global food system that means that food is traveling, as you said, from New Zealand and Australia and Argentina and wherever else. And I'd like us to start to construct a food system that's local, that's independent, that's networked, and that is about a mix of economic activity, so buying, but buying sustainably, and non-economic activity. I would like to see community allotments, neighbourhood level allotments everywhere, all over Greater Manchester and beyond. I would, I would love allotments to come back. I remember when people used to have allotments when I was a kid, and uh, they were, it was such a brilliant idea. Okay, last but not least, Aisha, in 2030 in Manchester, what do you want to see? I'd like to see lots of community kitchens. I'd like to see people bringing recipes together, using different recipes, fresh uh, lentils, fresh fruit and veg, bringing the old times together, quick, 
quick cooking ideas, quick recipes that that's on the go because we are going, we are moving fast with fast pace. There is so much going on. People don't have enough time to make a good hearty meal, but bringing in recipes that are quick and that is healthy and nutritional, and we are being a good citizen by doing that. Thank you. Brilliant. That is fabulous. Well, I'm looking forward to all those things very much, and I hope they happen sooner than 2030. So um, thank you all for your time today. Um, obviously, a massive thank you. Our guests were Corin Bell, Sarah Bridal, and Aisha Arif. And of course, thank you to Sally for the introduction. Um, Aisha's organization is the Very Active Women's Center. You can find them online at www.bawc.org.uk and on Twitter as Very Active Women. And they do uh, take donations of uh, food if you would like to help them. So have a look for their website. And uh, we, the, we are not finished yet with the Manchester Science Festival. There are free tickets available for the rest of this year's Science Festival events. Um, so, for example, this afternoon, one of the Science and Industry Museum's explainers will be talking to Professor Miles Allen about how carbon capture might be able to help with climate change. And there are lots of other events. So have a look somewhere below what you're watching now. There is a link to the Manchester Science Festival so you can look for events and uh, register for them. And there is also uh, a place where you can make a donation to the Manchester to the Science Museum group if you support their aims in sharing science and ideas with the population. So we've had a series of three events. This is the final one, this series, How Can I Be a Good Citizen of the World? We've had so many ideas and so many answers. And what's really brilliant about the whole thing is that there are so, so many of these things are things that we can do, we can make happen without waiting for big massive systems to catch up with us. People on the ground can get going on these things and that, that is such a powerful thing. Um, so thank you very much again to everyone who's been part of the whole series, especially our, and especially our three panelists this morning, to all of you who've joined us and submitted your questions, thank you very much. And thank you for joining us and goodbye. <laughs>